One of the things that, I mean, you hear about, you know, oh, we're going to have vertical farms, you know, in the cities and we don't need land anymore. We're going to farm <laughs> with chemicals <laughs> straight up and down. It's just so charming um, and wrong. Uh, for basil, you know, go for it. You know, for bib lettuce, couldn't do better. I mean, for basically foods that aren't really eaten that much and don't have that much nutrition, you know, it's fine, go for it, cool, no problem. But what we have to remember is the thing that makes food nutritious is stress. UV rays, heat, insects, water shortages, that is the roots have to go down deeper, you know, because of, they can't get access to water. And these things that produce the phytonutrients that make plants bitter to us, you know, uh, but also give it full rich flavor. Mm. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from climate activist and author Paul Hawken. Paul is the keynote speaker at our EcoFarm conference, which is happening tomorrow, January 17th, at the Asilomar Conference Grounds in Monterey Bay, California. Paul will be talking about the ways in which Real Organic Project and the Regeneration Project intertwine. Tickets are still available for in-person or live streaming, both of which include links to recordings of our awesome speakers so you can watch them at your convenience. Now let's listen to the second half of our latest interview with Paul Hawkins. It's one of the stories I'm, I'm going to interview a woman who did a very good podcast called Seen on Radio. It's a terrible name for a podcast. It's spelled S-C-E-N-E, -E, Scene on Radio. Right. And um, it's a very good one. And it, it's kind of the history of greenwashing, starting with the oil industry's response to global warming. Yeah. And, and actually, it starts with um, uh, Silent Spring, Rachel yeah. Carson and Ralph Nader. Right. And it says that the industry... Uh, the oil industry responded to those two with a full frontal attack. Mm -hmm. and, and they successfully managed to portray Ralph Nader as a kook to Americans. And so he became seen as a kook. They failed with Rachel Carson. She had the bad manners of dying and becoming a saint. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and it really failed. They, they, attacked her for everything, that she was a woman, that she was gay, that she wasn't really a scientist because she hadn't done a PhD, all these things. And ultimately people didn't care. And it became a, a, a transformative book that, that really changed our world, uh, almost in a way that almost no book can now because we have so much access to so much information. Mm -hmm. And back then they still had real bestsellers where everybody read it. Uh, you know, it was a, a, you didn't have this constant stream on the internet in the, in your pocket. You, you actually went to the bookstore and got a book. And after that, the, the, the industry reconsidered when climate change came up and it, at least in this podcast, they attributed it to one guy, a marketing guy. And he said, let's not fight them. Let's join them. And we just want a seat at the table. So they went to the big conference and they said, we just want a seat at the table. We get it that you're right. And actually they did. They knew it before anybody knew it because they, they had good scientists. And it became the 20 year goal, the 30 year goal, the 50 year goal. And it became an excuse to do nothing or very little. Uh, I'm sure they had good people in there who are not cynical, who are really trying to change from within those companies. Um, I'm not trying to vilify all, all the people involved, but I think that the outcome was that somebody had hit on a winning strategy. So I have a part that is very slow to trust in this situation that, that these companies have had a, 
you know, come to Jesus moment and that they are going to truly, truly try to create change as opposed to truly try to make money while appearing to create change. So I, I am at the very least intrigued, Paul, by what you say. I know that you've thought about it a lot and I know that you talk to a lot of these companies. Yeah, I didn't say they've had a come to Jesus moment. I'm saying that the the weather is going to make them have a come to Jesus moment. Yeah. That, that's, there's a difference. In other words, it's not like internally like, oh gosh, I have kids. You know, I realize that you know I've been a hypocrite and speaking out of two sides of my mouth. No, I'm just saying that functionally, pragmatically, they're going to look one way, look the other way, and saying, you know, they ain't working for us. <laughs> And and that's that's what I'm talking about. And the thing about Rachel Carson, I mean, I mean, one of the one of her biggest attackers was Norman Borlaug, who won a Nobel Prize, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, for you know really being a, a, one of the progenitors of the so-called Green Revolution, you know. And so yeah, it was a very powerful time in terms of agriculture, you know. And she 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 definitely represented a threat, you know. Um, because she threatened the pesticide industry itself, you know, and that was at the threshold where you know monoculture and and mining uh, of the soil was producing unhealthy crops, you know, healthy, unhealthy crops in you know fields that went for thousands and thousands of acres in each direction was sort of like you know a big sign on the highway saying "free buffet, all you can eat forever," and. <laughs> And so insects responded in kind, you know, and which the chemical companies loved, you know. Paul, could you explain that a little bit? Because I, I think a lot of people listening won't understand what's that mean, free buffet. Why would the insects come? Oh, because <laughs> it was delicious, first of all. <laughs> it was food. Uh, they breed quickly, by the way. <laughs> you know, Very any, quickly. Anybody notices. Uh, and so all animals uh, really, you know, basically go to the limits of the, the population goes to the limits of food. You know, as they run out of food, then obviously the population either stops or goes down. And in this case, there was no limits, you know. Because there were not natural enemies also, because it wasn't a diverse ecosystem. It wasn't a diverse ecosystem because of the... Uh, uh, all other plantings were removed. In other words, there wasn't, uh, like there are prairie strips now, you know, I mean, people are trying to put them back in. There's hedgerows in the UK, you know, which were always about uh, refugia for insects and, and birds, you know, that ate insects as well. Uh, and um, so those were all, pl the wetlands were plowed under. I mean, it, it was just, you know, fence to fence. Yes. And so uh, that's what I mean about all you could eat buffet because there was no there was no stop place, there was no border, there was no, you know, enclosure so the insects could you know You know, Elliot also to add to that studied the theory that um, you know, a healthy plant, even regardless of whether it's part of a monocrop or alone uh, will not be particularly attractive to insects. It's different for mammals. Healthy plants, very attractive to a mammal. Uh, we know that the cow loves to eat that plant, but, but the insects don't. And the insects biologically function more like vultures, you know, and their job is to pick off the weak and dying. Well, yeah, I mean, the, one of the things that, I mean, you hear about you know, oh, we're going to have vertical farms, you know, in the cities and we don't need land anymore. We're going to farm <laughs> with chemicals <laughs> straight up and down. It's just so charming um, and wrong. Uh, for basil, you know, go for it. You know, for bib lettuce, couldn't do better. I mean, for basically foods that aren't really eaten that much and don't have that much nutrition, you know, it's fine, go for it, cool, no problem. But what we have to remember is the thing that makes food nutritious is stress. UV rays, heat, insects, 
water shortages. That is, the roots have to go down deeper, you know, because of, they can't get access to water. And these things that produce the phytonutrients that make plants bitter to us, you know, uh, but also give it full rich flavor. Mm. And so, uh, so a healthy soil creates a healthy plant, but the, the plant is adapting, it is to its environment, you know, and, um, and that's what creates nu nutrients. So, um, Elliot's comment about the insects is absolutely right because in, in a sense, th there's this symbiosis, maybe it's not symbiotic because in a sense, the plants are trying to resist infestation, but there is a communication, there is a language, there is mycelium, you know, somehow communi communication going on between trees and plants and so forth, you know, that basically tells each other that, to alter your chemistry because we have a problem over here. And, and so there's communication. Now there's no communication in chemically farm agriculture, you know, and there's no hedgerows. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no wires. There's no way, there's no Wi-Fi. There's nothing there. So the plants are basically isolated, completely isolated. Uh, and what is so beautiful about true regeneration, you know, and the deepest and most biologically correct sense of the word is that plants are communities. All plants are, all trees are, all forests are, all grasslands are, uh, coral reefs, obviously, you know, but I mean, and so community means communing. That is to say, there's messaging, there's communication, there's signals, there's uh, going on, which is really how plants, you know, basically evolve and adapt uh, to changes in their external environment and to predation, for example, from plants or from me, animals or insects. Um, so there's this beautiful relationship, you know, it's like a dance. I call it the dance of carbon, you know, and in my new book, that's what I call it. It's about the dance of carbon. It's just uh, like, wow, look what's going on. And so, yeah, if you interdict it, if you stop it, which is what you do, you know, with uh, chemical agriculture, uh, that plant is like frozen in time and it doesn't really adapt, you know, doesn't really um, have that community. That, that's an excellent image, you know, of, of isolation even depression. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what happens to us when we're isolated is we're depressed or we're anxious or we're both. Yeah. We wilt internally. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I don't know if you remember that Malcolm Gladwell had a chapter in one of his books about this little town in Pennsylvania and they really live a long time. And he was trying to understand why, and it wasn't genetic and it wasn't their diet. Their diet was terrible. And he decided it was because they had this thriving, familial social life in this town mm. that was a carryover from their village in Italy and it just carried through. There was a, a, a study done of this nunnery in Iowa and the nuns lived just exceedingly long lived. And so the uh, researchers got permission to do autopsies when the nuns died. And the nuns said, sure, you know. And what they found was that uh, many, many of the, uh, the nuns who died, uh, their brains were like Swiss cheese Alzheimer's. In other words, they, they should have had Alzheimer's, but did not. And, uh, you know, what did they do every day? They said, well, let's, ask, let's go back to lifestyle. What did they do every day? Every day uh, they worked outside in the garden and so forth. Every day they sang. <laughs> and every day they made things with their hands. You know, <laughs> that's what they did and pray. <laughs> you know, so the Gladwell uh, example, absolutely. There's, there's things that happen in the way we socialize and we are such social creatures and um, that 
are inexplicable. We, we don't know the, 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 the connection or what happens to the nervous system or why it affects it. But it's interesting that in Gladwell's uh, example and in this nunnery that is a Carmelite nunnery, by the way, that the um, that it's a community uh, phenomena as opposed to well, this is one individual, you know, who happened to be let's study him or her, you know. Nah, it was everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Virtually. That yeah. Uh, there's another interview there, but I have two last questions, and I I. Uh, I don't want this to run too long for you. Um, I have two questions that I've been asking everybody, uh, and it, it, these will be uh, talked about in the Winter Symposium. And the first one is uh, the question, is organic regenerative? And Organic can be or, or isn't. It depends how organic is undertaken and implemented by the farmer. I mean, it's that simple. Uh, in other words, there's organic by the book, and I'm the book being somebody else's book. You know, the real book is the soil, <laughs> by the way. Um, and no, that's that's not regenerative because the soil in itself is not. Um, engaged in a regenerative process, you know. It's still a substrate in the USDA organic, you know, strict definitions and practices. So it may be a healthier substrate than, say, you know, uh, chemically infused dirt, okay, no question. But there isn't the regenerative practices going on. And the regenerative practices have to do, you know, with, first of all, the health of the soil creating healthy plants. I get carrots from the biggest you know, I actually don't buy them, but I see them in the store, <laughs> Whole Foods, and I don't shop at Whole Foods either for that matter, but but at Good Earth, and they have, you know, the split down the middle, no, it's they're not, well, you know, let's see, how do you get a carrot to grow so fast that it splits before you harvest it? <laughs> I mean, it's because you're over fertilizing, right? And it's growing too fast. And that's coming out of the biggest carrot company in the world, you know, in Stockton, and, um, so that's or, and they're organic, uh, right? So um, let me let me clarify yeah. the question. Organic as you think of organic, organic as you meant when you were running Air One and and actually going out and inspecting farms to make sure they were organic by your definition. Would you consider that to be regenerative? Uh, yeah, I mean we had the Sir Albert Howard, you know, uh, Lady Balfour, you know. F.H. King definition of organic. I mean, we were, that's how we thought, you know. And it changed, you know, if you're a dryland farmer, you know, in the panhandle, it was very different than if you're, you know, growing buckwheat in Pennsylvania. I mean, you know, so it, it wasn't like, you know, one rule, one size fits all, no. But the sensibility was always about feeding the soil, always about feeding the soil. And that meant whether it's externalities in terms, well, not externalities, but in terms of non-crop feeding, which is a cover crop, right? Or um, the uh, what was planted when and how, the integration of animals in when and how, or the integration of animal manure uh, in when and how, and the uh, use of uh, you know, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, you know, as a way to honor both the viability of the crop, you know, and your income at the same time to honor the ecosystem, you know, so that you didn't have any untowards effects, you know, unintended effects upon the pollinator health in the population uh, and the bird life, by the way, that ate the insects. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We... Uh, the what I call commercial organic came later. We 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 didn't know any. Of the, I don't know if they even existed when I started Erwan, you know. And so many of the farmers that I dealt with, you know, we had like you know thirty thousand acres under contract. But so many of them, I mean, they had been organic farmers long before. I didn't not because I showed up one day, you know, not not at all. I was like the idiot, the you know the urban idiot. I mean. 
I mean, I grew up on a farm, but I mean, I wasn't that much, I wasn't that idiotic. But the point being is like I was, you know, I didn't know about, you know, uh, dryland weed in the Panhandle or, you know, Eastern Montana. And, and, and so I learned so much. But what I learned also was that these uh, people, these farmers were dedicated to it for much deeper reasons than the marketplace. That's not why they were doing it. And in many cases, they had never forsaken. They didn't go back to something. They had never forsaken how they farmed. And they just had this, this sort of the best of, you know, American, you know, gold earn it, let's get this right. <laughs> and they were getting it right, you know. Um, and they were getting it right by what they knew. It, you know, instinctually what they could see, I mean, because they were learning, the farm always teaches you, the crops teach you, the plants teach you, everything, and and then acting on that knowledge and that learning, yeah. All right, well, let, thank you. Let me ask the flip question to that, which is, is regenerative organic? And by that I mean yeah. a lot of stuff's being called regenerative right now. In your mind, to be regenerative, must it be what you're talking about as real organic? Or is some glyphosate and some chemical nitrogen okay? Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, it's fine if you're making a transition. Yes. Yeah. For example, you have farmers putting glyphosate in their you know, backpack and then spot spraying, you know, basically Canadian thistle on the fence line. Well, absolutely. If, I mean, if, you, if the, that's the only way you can do it, you better do it, otherwise your field is gone. You know, I mean, they know that. So, um, but if your purpose is basically to do, get a no-tail classification <laughs> on your farm, you know, and to get, you know, some carbon credit or something, then no, it's absolutely crazy, you know, to use glyphosate. And, and um, so is regenerative organic? No, regenerative is whatever say it is. But I do think there are principles in regenerative agriculture. And those principles are, I think, locked in my mind, you know, you know, in terms of what regenerative agriculture is. And, but I do think just like uh, we have transition organic, I think we also have to support those farmers that are making a transition to that principled um, definition of regenerative agriculture. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's not about, you don't have it right, so we're going to take you out back and shoot you. But at the same time, right now, uh, just last month, in Syngenta, which has claimed gladly, uh, gleefully, the regenerative mantle, is also putting out editorials condemning organic, saying the world will starve if we farm Still? this way. Wow. Still. Still. Right. Yeah. yeah. And... And I just thought, you know, it's, it's getting a little, a little windy out there. A little, yeah. I think it's cutthroat. I think it's getting cutthroat. I mean, they're, it's almost like they're using your sword to cut your head off. You know, and no, I see that. And in the companies I work with, I think half of what I do is for Fend against Syngenta, uh, uh, Dow, uh, uh, Bayer, Monsanto, Cargill, ADM, Bungay, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I feel like I'm Janice at the gates because these are bigger companies and these companies are, you know, coming in and whining and dining and sweet talking executives at these companies, you know, about, you know, like they have the science, they have the product, they have the way, you, you, here's the way forward. And it's just another new way backwards. And, um, and then, then they're invoking, you know, shortages in food and the, the very things we talked about that make regenerative pragmatic, you know, and necessary, they're invoking as the rationale uh, for continuing basically in industrial chemical extractive agriculture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We shouldn't be surprised. No.
<laughs> no. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I, I even feel I'm beyond anger. It's just, this is the work. This is what we have to deal with. Yeah. And that leopards, you know, those spots didn't change when it went from organic. So it didn't go from organic to regenerative, but I mean, when regenerative is introduced, you know, same spots, same leopard, you know, I mean, of course, you know, uh, growing, protecting their interest, you know, making more money, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, before we end, sir, any last words you'd like to, something I didn't touch on that you go, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about that. I think the thing I really am fascinated with right now is pollinators. Uh, and it's a community, by the way, as well. And um, it's funny because how much we do understand from uh, entomology about insects. It's amazing the science that's out there, observational science, and it's extraordinary. And how little we understand uh, the relationship between our future and the uh, presence of uh, healthy pollinator communities. And, uh, you know, we're seeing, I, and I believe, because others have said this, um, in Oliver Mil Millman's new book, you know, uh, on pollinators and insects and so forth, he states it so beautifully, but the pollinator extinction that's occurring in the world is as serious as global warming. And that is something I don't think, you just don't hear about it, you don't see about it, you know, I mean, see about it, you don't see things about it much, you know, maybe in The Guardian occasionally, you know, it's really, which is great, but, <clears throat> uh, and, it's hard for people to understand that because actually almost everybody in the world likes less insects around them than more, you know? Right. And there's, there's valid reasons. For, they say, is that such a bad thing? It's yeah. a valid reasons, like, oh, they're outside, nothing's bothering us. True. <laughs> but, you know, so there's a huge bias against, you know, insects and bugs, you know, and um, bugs being insects that suck things, you know, like aphids. And uh, that's going to be a really important threshold to address, you know, and uh, issue to address worldwide because the ways we're farming and the ways we're doing other things are just wiping them out. Is, is that pollinator extinction primarily coming from chemical agriculture? Primarily. Yeah, and uh, neonicotinoids, you know, the uh, neonoids, whatever they're called, you know, in shorthand. But, I mean, they are, they are pernicious beyond pernicious because now companies are saying, well, we're not spraying with them. We're just coating the seeds. Mm. Well, it's water-soluble, like glyphosate, by the way, which is diabolic to me, to make water-soluble pesticides or herbicides. But it's, it lasts for five years. You know, it moves up the food chain. Uh, it moves into the plant. It doesn't just coat the seed. It actually is right there for the roots and goes into the plant. Uh, insects eat the plant, you know. So uh, it kills insects. Uh, birds eat the insects that are eating the plants. It doesn't have a good effect on them either. Uh, it's not as uh, uh, overwhelming to birds as it is to insects because of you moving up the food chain in a different way. But, but I would say that, and, and guess who's the biggest maker of neonicotinoids? Bayer Monsanto. So they're the biggest maker of herbicide in the world, glyphosate, and the biggest maker of the, probably the most pernicious, it's not the most pernicious pesticide, they're all pernicious, frankly. Uh, I mean, but it, it, it's the most ubiquitous so that it's the most pernicious and so forth. And, and, you know, one company I'm working with, you know, buys chocolate from Cote d'Ivoire and yields are going down. And I was saying, look at the pesticide. Yields are going down because of lack of pollination. And the pesticide is being used for other reasons, you know. And like, 
one plus one equals two, you know, in other words. And um, so, um, and farmers, poor farmers, you know, around the world, you know, I mean, where do they get their information from? And they have these short-term fears, you know, this year's crop, you know, this bug, this, that, this is happening, this weather, you know, this drought, this is, you know, my plants are suffering, they're susceptible, they're, you know, I mean, hey, Somebody comes in, it's just like this country with health, you know, here's a pill. You'll sleep well tonight. Probably made by the same person who made this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Could be, yeah. So I would say that's the thing that's really on my mind, you know, which is how to, it, it, it's, they're wedded, pollinators and agriculture are wedded, but how to marry these in people's understanding of it, seeing agriculture as a system and, and not just a, a source of food. I interviewed Larry Jacobs earlier this week. I don't know if you know Larry, but, yeah. uh, you know, he was describing the Del Cabo project. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, he and Sandy got in there just, just as the government was starting to give away all the chemistry to the farmers. And it wasn't established yet. It was just at the beginning of here's some candy. And by creating a market, for people who didn't use those chemicals, they were able to get an entire county in Mexico that prohibited the use of pesticides Amazing. and fertilizers. Amazing. Amazing. You know, my wife, uh, I mean, I'm, I guess we, I should say we, but my wife bought an eight, eight acre farm in uh, Pescadero uh, in Baja, Baja Sur. And I remember we saw it before it closed in the, the you know, and it, it was a, is a basil serrano chili rotation, you know, and it was just cringeworthy watching these um, workers, you know, with no masks and no, at all, with a back, you know, walking down with spray going in both directions, whether they're upwind or downwind, one direction is upwind, one is downwind, they go like this. You know, just, you know, and it just hurts to see that you can even employ a person and treat them so badly. Let's forget about the insects and the crop for a minute. Just the person themselves, you know, you see that in Mexico. And it just makes you furious. And Larry's done an amazing job down there, amazing job. And uh, it's not like a foot in the door. I mean, it's like, it's, I mean, the viability has been established so completely and that, that's how people learn and educate and so forth. And so, I mean, that's just a, an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement. Yeah, I, I agree. It's an amazing thing to see using the marketplace as a really constructive tool to provide the platform for changing behavior and making Everybody wins. Right. Everybody wins. The farmers, their families. He said the kids go to college now because the farmers can afford to have their kids go to college. I wish there was one more thing he would do. Make it clear on the packaging. <laughs> yes. It's too modest. I'll pass it on to him. You know, he can rotate it and so forth. But you know, when you see you first when I first saw Del Cabo, I go, Oh yeah, organic. Yeah, right, Mexico. I had no idea either. I just like, I didn't get it. I thought, I hope so. Yeah. They look good and they taste good. Yeah. And you know, like, but they look too good. You know, I mean, I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just like, like after all these years of seeing, you know, fake organic, you know, and imposters and people, you know, bending the rules, so to speak. And uh, it wasn't until later I thought, oh my God, it's not just organic. It's like amazing, you know, what he and I, Sandy are doing down there. Amazing. It's stunning. Yeah, yeah. It's and and all of this, it really is um, bringing back the roots of organic that was a social movement. Yes, yes. You know, but three quarters of the people weren't even farmers. They They were just just kids off the street, but, but it was a social movement that embraced agriculture as a, as a, uh, a tool to be used for change.
You know, and, and Bronner's, Dr. Bronner's, I mean, they're doing that in Africa and Ghana and so forth with coconut, you know, and in interplanting and intercropping and this and that, and just in schools and education and children. And I mean, they just, you know, it's all integrated. It's, it, I, I interviewed David last week. Oh, okay. I, I, I feel like I, this is good. <laughs> so Warren, David, and Larry. Okay. <laughs> I've been interviewing some fantastic people this trip. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate you joining that, that uh, cadre. Oh, wow. I don't deserve to join that cadre. They're amazing. All three of those people, they're just doing wonderful work. Yeah. I'm here writing. <laughs> <laughs> we need it. We need it. You know, it's, it, However, change is created. I, I, it's so interesting to me what a subtle alchemy it is. And it's not just this and it's not just that. And it's got to be action. You can't print your food, but it also has got to be, we've got to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. And next time, let's talk about uh, the, what I, call, I call it the neo food movement, you know. Yeah. All right. Next year. Yeah, next year. Let's talk right. about neo food. Yeah, yeah the, the, they, they, they're trying to print it. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. The company's named Zero Acre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, uh huh. <laughs> Good. All right, Paul, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe tell your friends, and leave us a rating and a review so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 99. Please join us next time for our 100th episode when our guest will be the globally renowned author and activist Vanda Nashiva. To support this podcast and our certified farms, become a recurring donor at realorganicproject.org and we'll see you tomorrow at EcoFarm, either live stream or in person. Thanks so much for supporting us.